Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Francis Lacoste, a distinguished VPE and CTO coach known for his exceptional ability to guide engineering leaders and teams toward achieving remarkable growth, fostering a collaborative and high performance culture. With a wealth of experience in addressing the unique challenges faced by fast scaling startups, Francis has mastered the art of balancing product development with organizational development, all while maintaining a strong focus on emotional intelligence and effective leadership. Listeners will greatly benefit from Francis's insights on accelerating their careers, enhancing productivity, and adopting best technical and leadership practices. Join us as we dive deep into the wisdom and experience of a coach who has been instrumental in shaping the success of numerous engineering leaders and teams across the industry. Francis, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Aaron. This is a thank, and thank you for the glowing introduction. I hope I live up to it. I am certain that you will. I've been excited to talk with you today. So maybe you can give us uh, a little bit of, of background. You know, um, uh, you're, you're a coach for engineers and uh, chief technical officers, but how did you get to where you are right now? And, and maybe just a, a quick summary of, of what it is you do, how your, your coaching is used by your customers. Yes. So, um, coaching is, um, um, is my focus, um, full-time focus since last year. Um, it's something I've done, um, uh, for probably the last 10 years or so. Um, um, but my background is, uh, I started a long time ago as a software engineer, um, mainly in the open source, um, domain and developer tooling after that. Um, and, after a number of years, actually, my background in, in uh, open source brought me to Canonical, which was the company, still is the company, I think they celebrated 20 years this year, um, which um, developed the Ubuntu Linux, the well-known Ubuntu Linux distribution. And um, that's where I made the switch to engineering management in 2008, um, which... You know, I, I got my my boss left a message to uh, on my voice voicemail. I was on parental leave at the time, telling, asking me to call back. And when I called back, he he, he, said, he told me we're creating some teams. We're thinking of creating some teams, or splitting the teams. And we think you'd make a good team lead. Um, are you interested? And um, I said yes, not at all knowing what I was getting into. I quickly realized that management is a different career path. Um, fortunately, I was uh, I found it very interesting and and grew there. Um, eventually, ended up at Heroku, the, the platform as a service, uh, one of the pioneer uh, in the in the path space. Um, and I came there to help build the remote culture. Um, and I joined at there as an engineering leader. And that's at Heroku that I, I discovered uh, the joy of coaching. So I was a director and um, really enjoying cultivating. As a director of engineering, one of the things I, I enjoyed the most was uh, cultivating the, the next generation of leaders. And at some point, uh, find out that um, I, after a reorg that I, w I had only a single team again, and um, there was a, a a guy on the team who wanted to become an engineering manager. So it was, okay, this is great. Um, I'm going to mentor you, coach you. That's that's what I like most. And then started offering that internally um, because we had a lot of first-time engineering managers. And continuing doing that over the years, and my team grew again. And uh, five years ago, I was, uh, again, leading uh, the largest uh, engineering department over there. And uh, somehow realized that the operational aspect of the role were not fulfilling to me. And that's when I kind of knew that career, well, that coaching and we're working around engineering culture 
would be my mission. So I I was able, fortunate enough to be able to transition in such a role at Iroku and then um, Salesforce. Uh, Iroku was part of Salesforce, so at some point got uh, responsible to help with engineering culture at the in, in, at one of the department there. And um, last year, um, yeah, there were the layoffs at, at Salesforce, and that was my chance to actually uh, for start, go on my own. And, and that's when I opened business as an independent coach. Very cool. Thank you for that background and, and history. So you've been involved with some, um, some, some fast scaling startups. And I've, I've heard it said before, you've probably heard this as well, that if, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a team. And there's a difference between doing the technical work, the, the product development and the, the organizational growth. Can you talk a little bit about those two aspects and, and, and how or what strategies you've used to be most effective balancing them? Um, yes, you know, I mean, the organization development is you are increasing your team size and then you need to structure your, um, uh, your organization. And that that is a thing in itself, but it's easier if you actually have a strong culture. And this is where uh, cultural development is very important. Uh, because the main challenge with scaling fast is that, um, and I experienced this both at Canonical and uh, Heroku, we, um, you know, when you grow fast, you kind of, you can double the size of the team in very quickly. Which means that after you know six months or a year, there's more people who are who are new to the company than the people who have been there for a long time. And if the culture is not strong and clear, and you're able to onboard the people in the new culture, um, you end up with a dilution of culture because there's kind of a gap, and then everyone comes with their previous experience, which can be enriching. But can also, but up too often it becomes confusing. You know, it's kind of because then you you're kind of it's not done deliberately, and and then you end up with kind of a, a mess. Even though like your our design sounds good on paper, um, the the <laughs> the people are not able to collaborate effectively with one another, and um, yeah, that's that's so the the one of the key practice there is around. The cultural definition. So, how are we working here? Why are we working here? What are we doing? And uh, are we relating to each other? Um, and uh, all of that, and um, and the onboarding. So, the indoctrination in a way of of people. Of course, a lot of people will say that. I mean, hiring as a huge part, but hiring is not enough. You know, because even though. You select the people. If you have a, a clear definition of, of your cl- culture, you can select people for uh, the culture fit, um, which can have a bad rep uh, for some reason, but it's actually a very important uh, aspect. Um, but the um, that's not enough because once you select them, they, they, they come in, they're, they're still they still need to start to work with other people and, and, and there's kind of a, yeah, that's the onboarding process, which is, I found very, very critical. What, what else have you found to be important with scaling teams quickly? I mean, the, the culture of course is crucial. So how do you maintain a high performance, supportive, um, safe culture? when you're scaling a team so quickly? The high performance and uh, safe culture are actually, um, I mean, the, the, the scaling fast just makes it more harder, but it's the same problem any teams face in a way. Um, and the key ingredients there, uh, and you kind of mentioned them, you know, um, uh, so when we think about high performance, we're thinking, Another word for that is kind of uh, accountability. You know, you, you know, we, we are accountable to uh, 
the results the, the result and the results here are delivering on, on the mission so um, so which is important for that is that the clarity you know, it's kind of this is a, a very it's kind of I see it as the vertical dim- dimension you know what is we're here for what and we're going to be accountable to to delivering that so if, if why, what we're building is not clear uh, and and for whom and and how then you cannot really have accountability because expectations are not clear so setting clear expectation and, and making it very clear what is the mission and and how we're achieving that that's one dimension but that's not enough you know for high performance uh, the other one is kind of what you when you mention like the safety aspect which is often called nowadays psychological safety so this i, I see more as the horizontal uh, dimension and because these two are orthogonal you can have like a team where uh, people are very well working very well together um you know everybody knows each other that sort of thing um but they don't get anything done um and you can have the other the, the, the case where there's a, a people are really kind of dedicated doing everything but they don't collaborate they treat each other on uh, not well and that's also not leading to high performance because then everybody is kind of working alone and and um and and jockeying for position and all of that i mean you i know i've experienced teams like that um so and and i think a lot of people have um so you really you really want both and the way i already mentioned so the way to achieve um, the accountability aspect it's it's around the clarity being clear on on on, on what is the team mission etc the how do you achieve the, the psychological safety this is by investing in empathy and vulnerability so in a way you want people to be able to relate to each other as humans and 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 for that you know you need to let your guard down you need it's it's not about how I mean, how I'm going to be perceived as the best, or all of that. Those are all things that prevents people from relating to each other. Yeah. Are there are there any specific tools or techniques, even workshops that you have implemented to help build psychological safety and and strengthen empathy within your teams? Yes, I mean at the. I'm a big fan of uh, Patrick Lencioni's work, um, which I mean, I mean, and the five. He's well known for the five dysfunction of a team, but he has a whole corpus of of of, uh, of work. And five dysfunction, five dysfunction of a team is for like for 2004, early 2000s. And this, he, what is now called psychological safety, uh, he called uh, vulnerability based trust. And uh, vulnerability-based trust is kind of the the foundational layer and the first dysfunction, which is lack of trust. And um, he he had two exercises that he used, that I've used a lot. And these exercises, I mean, there are are variations on it. So often you will find them in different forms, but the idea uh, uh, is is basically the same. So the first one is... um, Inviting, and I've done that with teams. It's a good way to bootstrap a team where everybody share, answer a few questions, you know, which is, um, where did you grow up? I mean, how, how did, how many siblings do you have and where are you in, in that order? I forget. And, but the, the critical question, that's really the others are more kind of just to get you landed is, uh, one challenge you face, you know, as a, as a child, uh, growing up and um other variation is kind of i i I, we we at salesforce we had like one standard workshop which was um like that but it was kind of your life story where you invited people to share some defining moments in their lives so what made them who they are today and um and it's kind of amazing because i've done it both with people who didn't know each other and people who, who, not, who weren't knowing each other. Um, and in both cases, you get to a very um, soft, um, sweet spot very rapidly where people kind of share things, which is kind of, oh, yes, we all experience challenge, challenges growing up, but, you know, it, 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 it's still, it's very personal and, and, um, 
and and so with the people who and and this is with people who don't know each other and in the people who know each other often what you find out is that the people uh, I've been working maybe for a year or six months or two years and the story that is shared nobody knew it on the team you know it's kind of I never knew that about you and now it kind of it 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 really brings people closer together because they're you're kind of showing vulnerability in a safe environment and and you decide how much vulnerability you're going to express but there the, the the container is such that you're you're invited to slowly step into that so this is one of these uh, th- these types of workshops are great when you're kind of starting the team or if you've never i mean because team buildings is more than having uh it, it does help to go out and have a, a meal together and things like that. These are all great things that builds the, the bonds in the team, but um, it's easy to stay superficial even with the, you know, not getting into the, 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 the little bit more tender spots, which is where you, you get to, to, to recognize the human beings between, behind like the professional masks. I, I really like that. I love the, question that you shared, which is about a life-defining moment and using that as a prompt within your teams to foster vulnerability and ultimately psychological safety. We have a volunteer organization here at Pipeline called CAD Club, where for a a 10-week class, we open our doors here at the office and invite middle school and high school age kids to come in and we teach them CAD and we teach them about engineering. And so we're together for a 10 week period of time, which is, you know, kind of a a little bit of a long time, especially for these, these younger students. And the first class we have together, we try to foster some of that vulnerability so that we, we feel safe together, you know, psychologically. And the, the question that we've used, which has been really interesting is, um, what, what's the most scared that you've ever been? And it, it's been really fun to watch some of these students, um, you know, share uh, in, in front of this group of people that they don't know. Uh, they, they usually don't know anyone else in the class. And, uh, but anyway, it's worked really well to, to encourage that vulnerability. And we, it, it's amazing that after that quick, you know, 10, 15 minutes where several of the students have, have shared about the most scared they've ever been, we all feel closer and it's, it's such a, an easy thing to do and, and relatively quick, but the results have been very, very, um, rewarding. And I, I really like your question might not be as effective with such young kids that don't have so many life experiences, but with, with our team of engineers here asking about what, what are some of the moments that have really helped, uh, define your, your life. I think that's a really wonderful one. I, I, I'm super excited to to use that one here at my team and, and see what we learn about each other that that nobody knew before. Just just like you said. Yeah, I love the. Our, when were you the most scared one? I, I can see how that works because it it is uh, it is inviting us right in a spot where we're we have to express some vulnerability. Being scared is a vulnerable moment, and now we have to share that with with the with folks. I'd, I'd like to add something here, though, which is um, these. I mean, this is kind of a great bootstrapping tool, but it, 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 just doing that is not enough. You know, I mean, it, it, doing that is super useful and and something that really should be done. But then you have to follow through, and and and. There, there's two, you, you know, there I, I, one thing, one move or tool that uh, comes is talking about the concept of psychological safety, what it is, why it's important, and then, um, and then living it, you know, I mean, in the team, if you do this sharing and then somebody uh, start, uh, present their design and then you get like uh, shut down and criticize personally because there's there your this day your design was not is not flawless you know um that kills the vibe very rapidly and you do it even though you felt uh like safe and 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 could you could express vulnerability i mean if in the work 
vul- the, in, in, when vulnerability is expressed, it's kind of not uh, uh, recognized and, 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 and people are not treading uh, lightly and or not correcting when they make a mistake, then it, I mean, the workshop is, was done for nothing in a way. <laughs> sure. That, <clears throat> that makes total sense. Well, let, let me take just a short break here and uh, share with the listeners that, that our company, Pipeline Design and Engineering, develops new and innovative manufacturing processes for complex products, then implements them into manual fixtures or fully automated machines to dramatically reduce production costs and improve production yields for OEMs. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Francis Lacoste. Francis, let's talk about the inner game. You work with a lot of uh, leadership individuals, right? Uh, VPs and and C level individuals, and and I know from personal experience that that role can be a lonely one, and that there there aren't always a lot of people around who understand exactly what I'm going through, and for sure, me personally, I know I, I've dealt with lots of stress, anxiety, fear self-doubt, imposter syndrome. I mean, the list goes on, right? How do you help, how do you coach your um, your clients through building up that inner game? And, and, and maybe even you can talk a little bit about what, what do you even define inner game as? How do you think about that? And, and how do you coach your clients through it? Yeah, um, so... That's critical, you know. The 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 uh, the, the um, my client. I mean, the clients are, um, like you said, very experienced, and and often I coach mainly technical leaders, you know. And so often technical leaders become leaders because of their uh, technical expertise. And um, but once you're the leader, the technical expertise is not enough, you know. And this is where like the the energy you're dealing with people you need to inspire them um give them directions and and there's a lot of interpersonal uh relationships uh that that are necessary for the success of of the organization and it's your responsibility to be effective at it and that will i mean interpersonal uh, relationship is hard. You know, this is where we get our button push, our triggers, and then we react instead of responding with uh, intentionality. And um, so, the inner game is allow is is basically what I mean is the the self, the inner self mastery of of our emotional life and our um, and and. And, and being able to to not get carried away by the everything that is happening. So, like you said, the imposter syndrome, the stress, the anxiety, the uncertainty, um, the loneliness uh, of the role. Um, and um, so, two things that held there. So, one is um, being in community. You know, we, as a, a CTO or VP of engineering, finding there are multiple communities where you find peers where you're able to discuss and and share your experience, and and that can create sol- solace. Another one is what I do. You know, it's kind of uh, a coach, and and because a coach creates that safe space where you can actually um, process what is happening and what you want to achieve, and see the gap between that. And the way I work is kind of it's um, so there's two aspects to the work. So one is the, the coaching aspect uh, proper, which is um, helping you gain perspective and reflection on what is happening for you. Uh, and 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 uh, so it, it's it, it's kind of a, in a way I. A little bit like a rubber duck, but like an intelligent, responsive rubber duck. I, I, you probably know th- this idea of rubber ducking, which is, hey, you have this, which engineers sometimes use to uh, to work through a problems where they talk to, they try to explain it to this little figurine on their desk. And by talking it aloud, it kind of straighten it in their head. But here, uh, there's someone who's kind of listening, reflecting, asking questions, 
Um, so yeah, kind of the uh, improved rubber duck, um, and 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 allows you also to the space to to ground in your experience, so that you can actually reflect from a more uh, embodied and grounded place. Um, and the other aspect is sometimes is bringing kind of tools or models that are useful in 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 that uh, circumstances. You know, so for instance. Uh, the, the, what I we discussed earlier around like the two dimension of high performance or psychological safety, those are things that can be learned. So it's more like a teacher um, tools guide kind of thing. That's really wonderful, and um, it 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 makes me feel, um, I guess, pretty good in a way about what I have done. Uh, because I've, I've been a part of a community. It was called Entrepreneurs, uh, organization. I'm, I'm not a member anymore, but I was for many years. And it was exactly what you were talking about. It was a community of other business owners and we were all kind of going through similar things, right? So it was super helpful to, to be a part of that community and be able to talk with other business owners, hear what they're doing to solve some of the same problems that, that I'm going through. So that was super helpful. And then I've also worked with uh, one-on-one a business coach of my own for for many years now, and he's also been tremendously helpful. So, so I'm batting two for two here based on your recommendations. <laughs> uh, uh, feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> um, can you share an example of uh, a specific leadership challenge that that you faced and how you overcame it? So, in this case. It- the the challenge was working with a leader who um and this is a common common thing which is um you know in startup life there's a lot of uncertainty and often that is out, not everything is under your control so um when that happens you know a lot of folks will react with anxiety and the anxiety is kind of ungrounded. And by definition, I think anxiety is, is, ungro- is ungrounded, uh, ungro- ungrounded um, versus fear. You know, when you fear something, I, I make a distinction between fear and anxiety. Fear, you know, there's something coming at you. There's a car, you know, that's going to hit you. You're, you fear for your life. You get out of the way. Anxiety is going around anticipating that there might be a car coming from anywhere, but there's no car. You're just kind of anticipating. You, you're kind of looking for what might be causing, uh, will cause a problem. And, and so in, in a way, this is, there's, you're, you're facing um, the, 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 the unknown and, and in a state of anxiety, basically you lose a lot of your capacity. You don't think as straight um, and it has like uh, it can have an effect on on your health and your sleep and all of that. Um, so the the, uh, the technique there is uh, come from um, my meditation background, and it's kind of developing. It's kind of a, a series of ex- a, a simple contemplative exercise to befriend the unknown. You know, befriend the uncertainty. So instead of uncertainty triggering anxiety. Uncertainty is just uncertainty, <laughs> which kind of sounds trite, but there's like a, a, a qualitative experiential difference between, you know, experiencing a, a uncertainty as something that leads to anxiety and uncertainty as, okay, well, I don't know what's coming, and I, but I don't need to try to anticipate the infinite space of possible there. Um, so, yeah, giving, working, like, a series of exercise, which is basically um, um, uh, embody uh, embodying the state, you know, understanding. Okay, now this is this is uncertainty. This is how I feel it in my stomach, and, and so paying attention to the sensations of it, paying attention to the thinking uh, that 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 is triggered by that, and and instead of following the thinking, noticing the thinking, noticing the the, the sensations. And 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 you do that like in a when there's no in a safe environment, you know, you do it by yourself when there, this is not you're not a high stress situation, and and by that you kind of gain um, 
confidence and you're at, and, and, and well, you, you get to know that state and then it kind of, okay, I'm facing uncertainty here and it, it, it's hard to explain. Um, the, I, I think how it works is basically you kind of uh, uh, have like an inner uh, compass that it's kind of, it, I mean, it's like when you don't know, when you've done something, experienced something, it becomes like uh, easier to 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 be on your game than um, when um, it's for the it, it's for the first time. So it's this is a little bit like the type of exercise. That's really really interesting, and I'd love to dig into that even a little bit further if if you're okay with it. Um, I, my my business coach actually gave me a really great definition of, of stress and anxiety because this, this is something that we talk about regularly. I, I still struggle with, with managing my stress levels and my anxiety. And he said stress. Um, and I think we can think of anxiety uh, as synonymous in, in this context is a result of placing your, f- uh, focus on an uncertain future, which is pretty much exactly what, what you just said, right? It's, it's uncertainty. And, um, and then you, you mentioned befriending the uncertainty and coming from kind of a, like a meditative background with that, which that's, that's a really intriguing idea for me. That's a, a new tool that I have not heard about before befriending the uncertainty, befriending maybe the, the, the stress or the anxiety. Can you maybe just help me take another few steps down that path and, and understand like, what are some of the, the, um, the, the tactical, things that you do to befriend uncertainty right um so in this case the uh, one good technical exercise uh, i took from the teacher shinzun yang who's an american uh, mindfulness teacher and um the technique uh, he calls it the power of don't know don't know is this idea of uncertainty and the 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 technique is um, so in uh, meditation, so you, you kind of sit by yourself or um, you know relax and and take like a, a, a re- so in a relaxed state, and then um, you notice so that you do that for for a set time. So this is kind of a meditation exercise. Uh, and if you Google, you know, the don't know uh, Shenzhen Yang, I think you might get a a, a YouTube video of it. I think. Uh, uh, but or it's a PDF or anyway uh, that that's where I got it um, and you 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 kind of use um, so you set a timer and then you pay attention to your experience and you notice in every moment how much anxiety there is you know and you can use like a Likert sta- sa- scale for that you know so one kind of oh no no anxiety I don't feel that then you can oh okay things are fine and you can know that that quality um and then it it might move you know some thoughts might come in and then you think you start anticipating about what's going to happen at that uh, board conversation tomorrow or what if the market shifts or whatever our our mind are great at generating <laughs> anxious thoughts you know and then you start feeling it and then it's kind of, okay now it's kind of it's it, it is uh, uh it, it is possible uh, i mean it's it's mid mid level, you know. Okay, so um, and you're trying to the, the the instruction in that point is kind of staying with it, um, trying to develop a, a certain sense of equanimity. So kind of not trying to push it away or um, uh, uh, follow it. So it's kind of so you 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 let you just notice it, you know. Uh, and and if it becomes higher, so you, you basically pick, in each moment pick. Um, a bucket, you know, none, a little, uh, some, a lot. And in a lot, then that's when it becomes overbearing. Then the technique is you, and in a way, there's kind of a prerequisite to, to, to be able to, to, to be in that, which is you kind of deconstruct it. And this is what I was thinking about noticing of what it is made up, you know, because anxiety is kind of a construct. It's a, there's, it has components and the components are the body sensations, uh, the, the, the images that we might see or, and, and, and the, the, the verbal thinking, you know, the thoughts that are, um, when we're talking to ourselves or things like that. 
And, and each of these three components creates a feedback loop, which is usually that overwhelming sense of anxiety. You know, we, we're thinking, oh, but what if this a- appear? Well, that's like a, a verbal thought. Okay. And you, you kind of notice the So you're kind of putting your attention away from the content of what is happening to more like the, 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 the texture, the, the categorization. And you kind of do that like again and again. And, and that's how you kind of befriend the, the old state, you know, and you develop like a, an ability to navigate it. And which means that in, 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 in practice, you know, now you might be in a, uh, in a situation where some anxiety arises and then you know it for what it is. You know, oh, okay. This is anxiety. I see the thinking here and the, the clutching in the gut and the tension in my shoulders and, and kind of you, you, you've known it, you know it. And then you're kind of, you, you, you you're, it becomes possible to relax with it and then it passes, you nor know, it, it, um, it resolves itself or it doesn't amplify. You know, it's kind of when you, um, I mean, and Shen Zingyan is great for that. He's kind of a geek and, and he, um, he often, you know, the, the intensity, uh, when you don't disentangle the, the, the components of the experience, it, it multiplies. So the intensity of the thoughts multiplies by the intensity of the sensation, multiplies by the dreaded images that we're seeing. It's seen as one big blob and it becomes like a big thing. Whereas if you decouple them and see, okay, there's this in the, in, in, in the ver- verbal thoughts, this in images, this in sensations, it becomes additive, you know? So it's kind of, there's still something, but it's much less, um, um, yeah, o- overpowering than uh, when it is um, all together and not distinguished. I mean, this is a bit abstract, but you basically need to... <laughs> apply it and practice it and play with it. And, and then it starts making sense. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, this, this is really cool. I'm, I'm going to start experimenting with this whole idea of befriending uncertainty and anxiety. I, I, I like, I like the sound of that. So I'm going to have to experiment with it a little bit and see if I can make it work for me. And that's, that's, that's actually probably more than enough. Just having the intention of befriending, I, I, uh, anxiety or the uncertainty and then exploring the states with that intention i mean that that's a lot of i mean you can you can make a lot of mileage just on that actually (laughs) i you know a thought comes to mind here i'm sure you've done this thought experiment as well a lot of people have where um uh, someone says to you don't think of an elephant and the only thing you can think of is an elephant at that point uh, but the second that that person says, okay, now, um, you know, think about whatever you want. And, and then it becomes a lot easier to not think about an elephant. And I, I think this is very similar. If you're trying to push that stress and anxiety away, it's almost impossible to do. It almost comes back at you twofold. But, um, if I understand what you're saying here, when, when we start to accept or, or maybe even invite, you know, it, that, stress and anxiety is there anyway when we open our doors and say okay come on in come on in have a seat let's talk at that point it's like ah okay um maybe i can deal with this now it's it's counterintuitive but once you let it in and and just observe it allow it to be there uh it becomes maybe a little bit easier to deal with totally um let's let's talk about uh getting back to technical leaders and you know the the stress and anxiety what we've just been talking about i think is is going to be one of the answers here um but maybe there are other topics that that you can share as well what are some of the common pitfalls that that you see technical leaders uh um falling into and and what are some like suggestions or pieces of advice as far as how how we can navigate those yeah so i work with a lot of um Technical co-founders um, and and who are wants to grow with the organization you know, when they get some success. Um, so often they start as hands-on, and then um, the team grows and they need to become a leader. And that's when they seek out. Uh, I get many clients who have that that situation or that background. And one of the pitfalls in that situation is the 
it's it's related to that uncertainty, but it is the fact that um, the it's kind of an the, the challenge here is like you have to navigate an identity transition. You know, go from a product builder, what I, I often call it, as like you, you go from product builder, the person who's building the product and uh, ends on, to the builder of the organization that builds the product. You know, it's kind of a shift in focus. So, um, and that becomes the answer. I'll, the pitfall becomes that this is kind of more nebulous, you know, when you know, I mean, building the product has its own uncertainty, but usually you, you have experience, you know, the technology, you know, how to, 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 to build it, you know, how to do that. You are less experienced and more uncertain about your ability to build an organization. And what, what happens is that there, there are two, two aspects. One is, well, you're, you're, you need to embrace the new ember and identity. Otherwise, you kind of just default. Well, I'm somebody who codes or and builds products. So we, <laughs> you're kind of, <laughs> are you going to explore things that are not supportive of that identity? And the other one is kind of, well, I know how to do that. I don't know how to do that other thing. So I'm going to put all my, I, I, you kind of default and re and, and to, to working to do what you know. And so that's that's kind of the, the the navigation of the pitfall. And the, the the path forward here is kind of to recognize the situation, embrace. I mean, become clear. Is it? I mean, it, there's no shame in wanting to stay uh, uh, somebody who keeps their who builds code, you know, and that sort of thing. That usually that happens often. You might be you, the role is not the CTO, but more like a chief architect, or that's more what suited for you. Um, um, but if it's clear that that's what you want, then you need to to uh, uh, to, to 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 shift your focus, you know, you, and and recognize that a yes, I could go and write that branch and write that feature, but that's not my job. You know, this is not my role. And and then it's about like relying on the team and empowering the team to do that. Terrific. That reminds me of the the book, the E Myth, where I mean, it's basically going from a, a technician, right, the person doing the work, to to the um, leadership role, the person that's kind of directing and managing and governing the work. Um, can can you think of an an insight or a piece of advice that you've received that has profoundly impacted your approach to coaching? I mean, the advice is listen. You know, I mean, and, and, um, it's also the, and advice also when I did the transition to management, um, my, my, my manager and, and mentor kind of, well, just talk to the person, you know, talk to, 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 to your reports and, and listen, you know, and, and this is the same thing in coaching, you know, investing, um, in the listening skills. And, and, and this is true actually in lead, for leader, all leaders, you know, we, we we all think we know how to listen, but to listen truly is an art that, as a depth, that we as very few masters. You know, so um, go because listening is the and to, to listen truly, we need to let go of our own um, own conception. Because otherwise, we're not really taking in the other person's perspective. We're kind of filtering it and distorting it from everything we know. So we, as much as possible, we want to, I mean, not negate it, but just kind of leave it at the side so that there's room for that other perspective. And then we can enter into dialogue and, and uh, I mean, not in the coaching role here, but in, 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 uh, in general here, um, then you can enter in dialogue. but. In the first part, really, you really want to open up and and take in the other person's perspective. So, listening, this is the the one of the highest leverage skills. Yeah, that's we have two ears and and one mouth, right? And we should spend more time, especially as leaders, listening than than we do speaking. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question, and then I'm almost going to rephrase it here, but. What's the question I'd, I'd love to hear your answer to is what's one thing that you've done to accelerate the speed of engineering or accelerate the speed of, of developing products? Um, and then I'm going to rephrase it by saying that this is something I've been thinking about lately. I'm not sure 
it's really possible to accelerate the speed of engineering per se. I think that every project kind of has its own timeline. And as engineering teams and engineering leaders, there's not really anything we can do to to truly accelerate that timeline per se. But what we can do is prevent it from being slowed down. There are definitely things that uh, occur within a project that that slow it down from the timeline it could have had were we not to stumble and make mistakes, whatever those mistakes might be. So uh, I think it's it, it sounds like a more interesting phrasing to say, how can, how can we accelerate the speed of engineering? But maybe I'll, I'll rephrase and, and ask you, what have you done in the past to prevent dramatic slowdowns to the process of developing an, a new product? Yes. I mean, I agree totally with you here. Right? And I think I like the framing of there's an, in, um, an intrinsic pace to each project. And um, so there's two things that come to mind there. So the, and they're both related. Um, and it goes with the listening. <laughs> and the, so <laughs> there's nothing more wasteful than building the wrong thing. So in a way, the way to accelerate is by really listening to the customer who, or the user. Who is this? Who are we building this for? What is their, what's the problem they're trying to solve? How are they trying to solve it? And and once we know that, and we know that um, this is like the iterative approach. What's the minimal thing we can do to so that they to help them out, move the needle a little bit on that problem, get feedback to make sure that we're actually solving the pro- the right problem, and and that the solution is acceptable. Um, because I mean, you can accelerate as much as you want. Uh, building the wrong thing, at, at it, it just going. If you look at it from beginning to actually being a success in the market, your timeline will be longer because your feedback cycle will will increase. You know? um, and and that's the other aspect. It's kind of decreasing all feedback cycles in your uh, in your organization. Um, the more ends off you have, the more um, review cycle. Um, you want to shorten them as fast as possible. Yeah, wonderful. All right. Well, Francis, uh, how can people get in touch with you? So either go to my website, the vp.coach, or find me on LinkedIn, Francis Lacoste. Wonderful. And we'll we'll include those in the show notes as well. Thank you. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.